I'm going to start off. The uh, title of my research brief was uh, The Effects of Title IX to Secondary and Post-Secondary Education. What I'm going to be talking about here, um, a brief history of Title IX, some of the early court cases involving litigation with Title IX, some of the compliance issues and, and the main reason that uh, Title IX has become so popular, um, some of the positive and negative effects that Title IX has had throughout the years, some current practice, and some conclusions. So, um, we have to go back to uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Title VI states, uh, No person in the United States shall on the ground of race, color, or national origin be excluded from participation and be denied the benefits of or be subjected to demonstration discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. You notice, um, you talk about race, color, national origin, uh, which at the time, you know, those were uh, so big issues back in the 60s. But uh, one, one group that isn't receiving protection underneath the, the Civil Rights Act is, is gender discrimination. There's no protection against it. Um, and just to illustrate the need, uh, prior to 1970, there were fewer than 300,000 girls participating in high school sports. That was a ratio of 1 to 27. Um, at the time, women's sports were uh, allocated 2% of athletic budgets nationwide, and uh, there were virtually no scholarships awarded to female athletes at the collegiate level. So in 1972, Senator Bay uh, proposed and sponsored a bill protecting also against gender discrimination. And it's very similar in wording to that of the Civil Rights Act. It reads, no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation and be denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Um, some of the early court cases involving Title IX. Uh, first one I mention here, Brendan versus Independent School District in 1973. This was a case that involved some female athletes who had been denied the right to participate in um, or participate with some of their male counterparts in high school sports. So they brought suit against the school district, not actually underneath Title IX. They brought legal action under the Civil Rights Act and the Equal Protection Clause. Um, but it is important because the court makes mention of Title IX. Um, they noted that uh, in the passing of Title IX, Congress recognized the importance of all aspects of education for women, particularly that of, of high school sports. Uh, it stated that it's an important and integral facet of the educational process, and discrimination in high school and interscholastic athletics constitutes discrimination in education. And this was in 1973. Um, not until 1979 was legal action actually brought um, under Title IX. Part of the reason for that was the ambiguity and the uh, the unclarity among organizations involving compliance issues um, and what does it mean to, to be in compliance with Title IX. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, as it pertains to athletics mostly, but um, Cannon versus University of Chicago in 1979 is important in that this was the first case um, brought to the Supreme Court involving Title IX or action brought under Title IX. It involved uh, a female student who sued the University of Chicago claiming she'd been denied admission into medical school because she was a female student. Now, initially, um, the courts denied her claim um, based on the fact that uh, Title IX, you, you couldn't uh, bring cause of action under Title IX. The Supreme, Supreme Court uh, overruled, and uh, from thenceforth, it was decided that, uh, that you could bring legal course of action under Title IX. Um, next court case here to mention in 1991 of significance. This was the first court case where uh, 
Under Title IX, damages could be awarded. Up until this point, you could bring legal action, but uh, damages could not be awarded. Um, this case involved Christine Franklin. She was a student in North Gwinnett High School uh, who was the victim of sexual abuse by a teacher. Now the uh, teacher decided to resign or agreed to resign um, with a stipulation that all charges and investigation into uh, the case be dropped. The, the district agreed um, and Christine Franklin sued um, seeking damages for um, the sexual abuse. The uh, lower courts denied claiming that uh, Title IX um, you weren't able to award damages under Title IX. Um, the way it made its way to the Supreme Court, um, and the Supreme, Supreme Court ruled in favor of Christine and found that damages could be awarded for an action brought to enforce Title IX. This opened the floodgates, so to speak, for litigation involving um, Title IX in, in both the athletic and the educational aspect in, in uh, sexual harassment and uh, unfair hiring practices. Um, now, the main reason why Title IX has gotten so much attention in the media is uh, some of the compliance issues um, in the early 80s and 90s. Uh, and and uh, it was because how do you define equal opportunity for members? If, if uh, you read through the wording of Title IX, it's, it's just a few words, 17 or 18 words. It doesn't uh, explain much. So in 1975, um, there were some further regulations and clarifications, um, these ten in particular, um, from the Office of Civil Rights provided regulations and guidelines on uh, how a school or organization was to provide equal opportunity for members of both sexes, and, and these pertain mainly to athletics. Now. In 1979, this is by far the most publicized issue of Title IX. It's been known as the three-prong test, or how an organization can perform a self-evaluation of whether or not it's in compliance with Title IX. Um, the reason it's called the three-prong test here is there's three areas that a school or organization can show compliance. Not in all three, it only needs to show compliance in one. First way is to provide participation opportunities substantially proportionate to the ratio of females to males in the undergraduate population or demonstrate a history of continuing practice of program expansion or to meet the interests and abilities of the underrepresented group, which in most cases is females. Um, problem with this, especially the second and the third prongs, is um, how does a school or organization demonstrate a history uh, and continued practice of program expansion or how does it show that it's meeting the interests and abilities of the underrepresented group, it has become much easier and cost-effective for schools to come into compliance with Title IX through this first prong, which is to provide participation opportunities that are substantially proportionate to the ratio of females to males in the undergraduate population. Unfortunately, that's led to, uh, and I'll get to this uh, as part of the negative impacts or effects of Title IX, that's, that's led to the uh, universities cutting male programs from their uh, university in order to uh, increase the ratio of, of females to males participating in sports. But uh, some of the positive effects uh, in terms of participation rates. Uh, in 2011, over 3 million girls participated in high school sports. If you remember uh, back before the 70s, it was uh, 300,000. Substantial growth there, 200,000. Um, are participating at the collegiate level prior to Title IX, the numbers were closer to 30,000. Um, 43 percent of scholarships um, given at the high college level are given to women. Um, beyond participation rates, some of the obvious effects of just participating in sports. Um, Anderson uh, studied and, and wrote about the social and behavioral effects of uh, sports in particular to women, there's a positive relationship between participation in high school sports and educational aspirations, educational attainment, and wages later in life. Um, and uh, she found this was especially important for girls who must try to maneuver their way through traditionally male occupa occupations later in life. And uh, 
just a few stats that was given in, in her research. If a state's female sport participation rate rises 10 percentage points, then the average levels of schooling in the state will rise by around 0 0.04 years, and employment rates will rise by 1.5 percentage points for women. Um, another researcher, Tally Fierro, um, in her research found uh, weight control, problem-solving skills, self-esteem, social competence, academic achievement, and reduced rates of juvenile arrest, teen pregnancies, and school dropouts were all affected um, when uh, participation rates increase for girls in high school athletics and uh, conclusion sports also create important opportunities for students to contribute to the school community which may cultivate an increased commitment to or identification with school and school values which can be important uh, for administrators wishing and hoping to uh, cultivate and build a school culture as i mentioned before some of the uh, negative or perceived negative effects of Title IX is that uh, many feel that Title IX forces universities to cut male programs um, in order to show compliance using prong one of the three prong test. Uh, from 1992 to 1999, 386 male teams were dropped um, from college, this is colleges and universities nationwide. Um, the Title IX does not, however, mandate that an organization drop male programs. Um, it's just many universities feel it's easier to drop male programs or more cost effective than it is to add women teams. Um, the big, big issue is uh, universities are unwilling to dip into the huge amount of money spent on the quote unquote revenue generating sports like football and basketball, which do generate revenue but also have tremendous costs in order to run their program. Um, many researchers suggested that uh, male programs could be spared the chopping block if universities were willing to curtail um, the football budget of most universities, um, awarding fewer scholarships to football players and, and that sort of thing. So it's, it uh, isn't necessarily Title IX that's forcing universities, universities to cut male sports programs. It's uh, their uh, unwillingness to think outside the box and add women's programs or, uh, or uh, get a hold of their uh, budgets for other sports. Um, other negative impacts or effects Title IX may have had is uh, the number of women in coaching and leadership positions seems to have, seems to have fallen. Um, right now it's 43 percent of head coaching positions in women's sports are occupied by females where the numbers were a bit higher prior to Title IX. And uh, at the NCAA Division One level, there's only five out of 120 athletic directors that are female. Um, so what does this mean for the high school ad administrator? Um, much of the uh, literature uh, involving Title IX has to do with uh, aspects at the collegiate level, but at the high school or uh, middle school, even even um, elementary level, um, administrators need to be aware of equal opportunity for their students. Um, in talking with my athletic director and principal at my high school, um, the issues they face with equal opportunity are uh, scheduling fields and courts equally for uh, male and female sports, um, making sure that uh, the disbursement of uh, funds is equal between the sports, that they have equal opportunities for competition, um, and, and so forth. Also, they, my administrators told me that uh, sexual harassment and unfair hiring practices are mainly what they have to consider and worry about when, uh, when thinking about uh, Title IX litigation. So some conclusions. For the, for the uh, potential administrator, continue to be an advocate for equality, not just with gender, but uh, in all aspects and for every group. Um, it's uh, a duty to educate the faculty and staff to increase awareness of uh, fair practices and equality issues, and uh, just encourage participation in sportsmanship, uh, shown to have an increased uh, effect on, on school culture and, and positive attitudes towards education.